Today's show is brought to you in partnership with Adreno Spearfishing Supplies. Adreno is one of the world's biggest and best spearfishing stores. You can visit Adreno online at spearfishing.com.au or in-store at their Brisbane and Sydney locations. G'day, Nova Spiro community. Thanks for tuning in today, guys. Today we are interviewing someone I've been looking forward to for a while. He won the Australian Champs this year. Uh, up <laughs> Here we go. Stars. <laughs> he won the uh, Australian Champs and he's a, he's a seven-time New Zealand champion. His name is Dwayne Herbert. He uh, he loves a simple setup. He's he's sponsored by uh, Bo Shea. But today we talk about his uh, his, a latest story of his um, getting bailed up, sort of, or having a good check out by a great white in the three metres of viz off um, Stewart Island Field, and I think, or, or in that area. And uh, we talk about boarfish, kingfish, all sorts of good Kiwi spearfishing. I love it. Turbo, <laughs> you? Did you mention he's a Kiwi and he's now the Australian title holder as he, well? He, he won the Australian champs, I believe. Good on you, mate. Yeah. Thanks, sir. <laughs> wanted to share awesome experiences that you can have when you are in the water and that's why I started spearfishing. I just clamped down on the reel and got drugged down to about 50 feet and I'd never had a battle like that before in my life. So when you're learning where to hunt and find fish, they're the hot spots, it's where fish want to be. Don't overcomplicate your gear, don't go diving dressed up like a Christmas tree. <laughs> <laughs> I actually started off in stubbies with a bloody belt with a pig knife on it. And I've seen this big fin break the surface, roll into the water, look down, here's this nice big break. <laughs> Once your face hits the water and you feel relaxed and all the other stresses of life seem to disappear. It's a whole new world and it's mysterious, it's magical. Beats the shit out of knitting anyway. Oh yeah. G'day Noob Spiro listeners, thanks for joining us today. We're uh, we're in for a treat, we've got the current Australian champ, although he's a Kiwi. <laughs> uh, he's, he's a multiple New Zealand champion actually and uh, he doesn't mind coming over here and giving the Aussies a touch up. Uh, so <laughs> it's great to have you on the show and joining us uh, Dwayne Herbert. How are we getting on? Good, mate. Good to, good to be talking with you, mate. Um, thanks for, for taking the Australian titles out too. Shrek's been letting me know ever since. Um, <laughs> he's an absolute pleasure to work with now, so um, I must uh, thank you for that. Thanks, uh, mate. So first the rugby and now spearfishing titles. No, awesome, man. Oh, uh, did you mention the rugby? <laughs> Go away. This is just a pest. Anyway, um, all right, Dwayne, um, <laughs> Mate, if we could uh, get a little bit of uh, your spearfishing history, like where did you get started and how did you get involved in spearfishing? Yeah, I started when I was quite young because my old man, he was a commercial diver over here in New Zealand. So I was always trying to jump on the boat and head out with him on the weekends or holidays or whenever I could. So I reckon I was about seven when I was out there swimming around. Oh, and awesome. uh, yeah, just carried on from there. So what, 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 was, what was your dad commercial diving for? In New Zealand, we call them kinners, but over there, they're urchins, like the, the round, spiky hedgehogs of the sea. Okay. Oh. And uh, abalone, or powers over here. And so what, you just started jumping in and just trailing your dad and um, and learning how to harvest kinner? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was always he's always a fan for making you pay your way, so I'd always have to catch a few kinners before I took off with a spear gun, but that's all I wanted to do was just go and shoot fish. Okay. Cool. So seven years old in a spear gun out in the open ocean. So what what part of New Zealand was that? In the Coromandel on the on the east coast there, just uh, just pretty much east of Auckland. There, there's a few islands, Mercury Bay area. Okay. Um, yeah, it's pretty nice diving there. So seven years old. No wonder you're um, winning competitions these days, and and a lot of them. Um, what what so what what was what was it like for you? Like what what fish did you start shooting? Oh, just anything that moved, pretty much. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, you start off with the easy, the basic reef fish and, and um, just try and progress from there. I wasn't allowed a spear gun until I was about eight or nine. I had to use a uh, Hawaiian sling. Okay. Right. So, I was, so I was, you know, shooting those leather jackets that swim right up to you, but uh, put a bit of a dent in the population there, and then he says, all right, you can start going for other fish now. So what, what was your first kind of memorable fish? Like, What's a what's a story you remember about maybe a really memorable fish when you were just starting out? When I was starting out, uh, Jeep, I wasn't that good, actually. It took me quite a while to bloody actually shoot some fish. Um, but once I got the hang of it, I, I shot a 
12 kilo snapper when I was 10 years old. <laughs> wow. The well, old, the, yeah, they'd been diving all day, um, catching kinners at this at this place. It's quite renowned for big snapper. It's quite a nice place to dive. Yep. And I'd just been pottering around, and then at the end of the day, the um, we moved the boat probably on know 500 meters down the coast from where we were catching catching kinners, and I just jumped in and started swimming around to um, see what I could kill. And <laughs> there was a um, we call them poor eye in New Zealand, but I think they're blue moes over there. Okay. Um, it was sitting in the weed, and I, I dived down on top of it, thinking, oh, yeah, I'll shoot this poor eye. It was probably about 10 metres deep or something like that. Yep. And I dived down, I lost sight of it, and then I, as I as I got to the bottom, the, the, the weed parted, and this um, poor eye sort of popped his head out, and I thought, oh, it was underneath the weed, so I just shot it in the head and saw it to the surface. And I got, I don't know, I got up to the surface, got about two metres away from the from the end of my gun. I was like, shit, that's a snapper. I yelled out to the old man, i got a big snapper, i got a big snapper. It was squeaky voice as I did at that age and uh, <laughs> they, they sort of just laughed at me and said yeah whatever and then there was a big tail splashing around my head <laughs> they were pretty uh pretty amazed that I'd bloody I was gonna say that's a pretty impressive fish for a 10 year old like you would have been you would have been reminding people about that fish for a while <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 I've probably got a bit of a big head for that after a while but no, I got brought down, brought down to earth pretty quick. But um, <laughs> so, what did you have any obstacles getting started? I mean, or did you have a, did you have a mentor? I mean, what 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 were some of the challenges you experienced? Well, you, you mentioned did I have any obstacles or or you know challenges? I was really lucky in a sense that uh, you know when the old man goes out diving, there's a crew of four or five divers diving for kinners all day. And, uh, and, you know, that's the best training you can have is being in the water and being surrounded by people who dive every day. Yeah. yeah. So if I had any issues or, you know, if I – I pretty much just followed, you know, and um, just monkey see, monkey do. Just did what everyone else was doing and, and, and just picked it up from there. But I never really had any big issues, I suppose, or, or um, challenges, just – you know, once you shot one species, it was right. What's the next species I can take? You know, tick off the list. The only real hurdles was getting out of school to go diving. <laughs> yep. The old man, old lady were, were school teachers originally. You know. Oh no. So school was important, but then the old man sort of figured that work's probably just as important. Mate, could you share with us uh, a hunting technique that you employ regularly, or that you think's really important? Um. Yeah. I'd like to talk about kingfish and um, and shooting shooting kingfish or, or you know targeting kingfish. Yeah, cool. Because I, because I feel that a lot of like the sport is booming and um, yep. and there's a lot a lot of people these days jumping in the water, gone down to the spearfishing shop, spent a thousand bucks on gear, thought right I'm going to dive, I'm going to shoot myself a big kingfish. And you go out, they go out to an area and people have told them about it, line fishermen or whatever, and they jump in and. These kingfish swim up to them and then they they shoot them in the guts and they rip out and go and die. Yeah. Uh, I think I think that uh, you know people need to think a lot more about where how they're going to shoot their fish rather than just jump in and shoot it. Yep. Yep. And um, and with with kingfish, me personally, you know, you find your you find your 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 pressure point where the where the tides hitting hitting you know a, a bit of a rock or or a, or a ledge or somewhere where there's a lot of bait fish around and the kingfish are going to come in anywhere around there or you know you sit there long enough you, you'll have them come in and and you you just can't rush it like you know you get buck fever and you just want to race down and spear it you know put a spear into it but you've got to take your time and and uh plan your shot and so you know if you're, you're diving on a on a I don't know, say a ledge at 10 metres and you're competent to dive to 10 metres, you go and sit there and you wait. And when the fish comes in, you just keep your cool and wait for them to come closer because they're very inquisitive fish as it is. They will come into you. Yep. And uh, and make sure you, you place your shot. You know, if it's a 50-50 shot, don't take it because 90% of the time the fish are going to die. Yep. If, if, you're, if they're going to get off, you know, because you've shot them in the guts or you've shot them somewhere that's going to fatally hurt them. In terms of... Um, of- when somebody that's new to it makes that shot, and you're saying you've got to get a put a good shot on this fish, a holding shot, where are you? Can you explain how you aim, how you aim a gun, and effectively, and what points on the fish you pick out? Right, yeah. Uh, 
that's another another one. When I'm when I'm aiming at a fish, uh, I just point and shoot like um, the tip of my gun. I just line that up with where it, where I want it to hit it on the fish and pull the trigger. Mm-hmm. A lot of people look down their shaft and line it up, yep. um, but I I've never been able to do that, and so I've just got the technique of making sure my arm's straight. Like if you're going to shoot a fish and your arm is cocked back a bit. Um, and not straight out in front of you, you haven't got a good a good visual of that whole spear gun in front of you. Yeah. Right. But if, if your gun's right out in front of you and you can see the tip of your spear gun and then the fish, you can make a good uh, assumption of where it's going to hit. Yeah. So for me, it's sort of just wait for the fish to come up. It depends, you know, if it's in line with you, and vert- uh, you know, horizontal with you, and it comes and it turns side on, I aim for the petrol fin, above the petrol fin there. There's a uh, lateral line. Uh, just right anywhere near the gill plate, the back of the gill plate. I yep. aim for out there. If you're on top, you know, between the eyes and back a bit, and um, just make sure you're close. Cool, that's and, good. And are you, if because they they do circle you a bit, don't they? The um, the kingies, um, or yeah. they, they sort of come around you a bit. So, leading up to the shot, the fish is about your level. It's sweeping around you. Are you? I, I hear guys they say, oh, you find an apex between where the fish is meeting and the end of your gun and then you pull the trigger like some guys do that other guys track the gun through the water along the side of the fish what do you sort of tactic do you employ to pick that point out leading up to the shot if they're if they're cruising nicely you know circling below you you just dive down have your gun in front of you and you sort of just track it until it's close enough then you you know line up pull the trigger but well not so much with kingfish but a lot of other fish i've I've learned to hold my gun out in front of me, mm-hmm. and the fish say the fish is swimming from left to right in front of you. Just aim, start swimming right, and just try and intercept where it's swimming to, and yep. then just pull the trigger as it's as it lines up with your gun. Yep. Yeah, yep. right. That's pretty pretty tricky thing to do, but uh, it's probably one of those instinctive things that it sounds like you've developed over time, Dwayne. Um, but um, you know, like there's nothing like time in the water, like you identified earlier, and then you start honing those sort of instincts. Even the way you you shoot your gun, you're you're you, you sound more of an intuitive shooter rather than a, a method bound kind of guy. And it, it there is it, there does seem to be those contrasting styles with people we've interviewed and things like that. And um, so any any other tips for guys that um that are maybe starting to chase these kingfish? I mean, it's a that that's a big quite a tough fish to, to take on when you're just starting out as well. Yeah, uh, kingfish are dirty fighters. Mm. Um, so as soon as you shoot one, usually you'll get a second or two where they, oh, shit, they've been hit. The, the, the shaft hits them and they, they're slow. And they th- you think, oh, yeah, that's a good shot. I've got them. I've heard them. Yep. But then they start to kick into gear and they'll go straight for any reef that you can uh, that, you, that they can get, get to, you know. So... If, you know, if you're new to the sport and you shoot a kingfish, just be aware of where your float line is. Make sure it's not wrapped around your body. And if there's any reef around, just try and drag him away from it because he'll get in there, bend your shaft, pull your pull the shaft out. Well, not pull the shaft out, but they've got a technique. Well, they've got an amazing technique to be able to wriggle until that shaft pops off them somehow. Yeah, okay. And they'll leave all your gear down in the reef and it's pain in the ass getting back. What's your... um? What's your personal best kingfish, and what, 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 how did that sort of come about? Uh, it'd be 40 kilos. I shot one about 40 kilos in um, <laughs> the island a few years ago, we went out, which is in New Zealand. It's renowned for big kingfish there. Yeah. And um, we were actually filming me and my mate Julian, who's done a lot of diving. He grew up with me, so he was filming me, and I just dived down, and these three kingfish come in, and... You know, at the time, you know, you're you're looking for big kingfish, but I wasn't thinking, oh, this is a big kingfish. I just thought, oh, yeah, no, this one will do. And uh, and there was three there. He was in the middle, so there was one in front of it, probably 25 kilos, and he was right in front of me, and I had to shoot past him to shoot this kingfish. But like like I was saying before, I just sat there and waited, and he came straight into me. I aimed straight for the petrol fin just above the lateral line. And um, he was close enough, the shaft went straight through and then held on, got to the surface and just, he was trying to get to the reef and I was just trying to get him away from the reef. Nice. So he gave you a bit of curry? Yeah, yeah, he did. He was quite a strong fish. 
yeah. but he was hurt too like it was a good shot yeah so it didn't take too long probably five minutes and i had him in my hands yeah nice uh, have you got that is that video up online it's on my dvd actually okay. um I'm done a, i made a dvd called works fair play okay cool. and I, we um just took a video camera with us around for about four or five years when we were younger and we put a whole lot of stuff together cool i'll link that up in the show notes so people can um check it out if they want to that sounds awesome yeah, yeah it'd be awesome bloody yeah. good Cool. Well, you sound pretty passionate about making sure these kingies get landed, mate. New bloke, uh, he wants to hunt them. What's a good setup to actually land these fish? Right, yeah, you want a good, powerful gun. So a lot of people these days are, are using two rubbers, I don't know, 16 mil or 18 mil or something, um, on there on a on a 120 gun. You know, I've never used two rubbers. I've always used one rubber, but I just made sure it was a strong rubber and not too long. Yeah. Um, you know, one ten is getting getting lower. You know, short, but you can, it's still doable as long as you as long as you've got enough power to send the shaft through the fish and hold on. You know. Yeah. Um, but I'd be using a one twenty single rubber with a uh, yeah good good body rubber and thirty meters of float line and a float. Yeah. So as simple as you can get, sort of thing, but. Um, good enough gear to, to do the job, you know, you don't want to go and buy a shitty old bloody uh, spear gun that's 100 bucks with the with an 8mm shaft that doesn't have anything bloody. Yeah, I know no. the, I know the ones, mate, the big Mako head on them, double flopper thing, and <laughs> yeah, you power yeah, it up yeah. as much as you like, and as soon as it hits something, it stops. You can see it's stopping in the water as it goes. Uh, yeah, uh, just as you were talking, I was thinking, man, I think a lot of crap guns have been responsible for injuring fin, uh, fish yeah. as well, like, particularly with guys getting started. Like when you get, I mean, it, it, there is something to be said for like learning how to hunt with a gun with poor range and all the rest of it. But if it means you're injuring fish and they're escaping to die, I mean, that's mm. that's pretty crap. Like you're better off just spending that bit of extra money, get a good gun that's going to do the job. Cool. What, 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 do you have a brand preference, Dwayne? Yeah, yeah. I, well, I'm, you know, sponsored by Boche over here in New Zealand. So, oh, okay. Uh, but yeah, not any biasness or anything. I do actually really like their gun, and I've actually used their handpiece okay. since I was about ten years old. You know, it just it seemed to be a really comfy handpiece, and and then now the guns that they're using are, well, the guns they make are pretty bloody good. So, I've, you know, yep, cool. I've sort of used. Um, I, I just change the open end muzzle to a closed muzzle because I don't really like the, the open muzzles. Okay. I know. The um, shaft seems to, you know, if you when you're loading it, if you haven't got the nylon on properly. And that's the other thing. It takes a lot longer to load because you've got to get the nylon over the top and around and the rake from the rubbers and then back down the side. Yep. Whereas if you've got a closed muzzle, it's just straight down, clicks in, and then, you, you know, if there's a fish down there, you can uh, quickly load the gun and get yeah. in and shoot it. It's funny you should mention this too. I mean, we interviewed, um, we, we just interviewed Ian Puckeridge a while ago, mm. and uh, you know he uses a one rubber, simple setup, same as you, and um, it just sounds like it gets the job done. When you when you're a competition diver, I think you tend to be a lot more efficient with your time because you you want to reload quickly and all the rest of it. Um, so it's it's interesting that we've had the same sort of points a couple of times in a row. Um, anything else for guys chasing kingfish? Any other sort of parting tips? Yeah, no, just you know, just look for the fishy areas. Yep. And and you know they they're a predatory fish, so they they'll turn up where there's fish or food. Okay. And they will check you out. So a bit of bit of uh, some runs the way to go, a bit of current. Yeah, yeah. Find a bit of current with a uh, bit of structure with a bit of you know like it's a a definite point where the where the tide's going to hit it. You know, with it, you know. Maybe a ledge that comes up from 20 metres up to 10 or a rock that drops off to 30 metres. There's a front edge there or just somewhere with significant structure to hold hold smaller fish because the smaller fish attract the bigger fish, obviously. Cool. Good stuff. All right, so um, moving on, what's the scariest moment you've had out spearfishing and what did you learn from it? Um, spearfishing, scary, right. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Um, oh, I don't know. It's put me on the spot. I bloody saw a white yesterday, so <laughs> that gave me the shit. <laughs> <laughs> All right, tell us your great white story. 
Oh, that was the first one I've ever seen. But because um, down where I am now, diving, I've, you know, I live down the bottom of the South Island. There's there's a lot of whites around, and they're, they get more prolific. But um, I was actually just testing out my boat because I've had the pontoon shortened on it, and uh, so I thought, oh, well, I'll race out and just go and catch a feed of powers and and um, test out this motor because it's been serviced and rah rah rah. I jumped in and I was about five. I was only in the water for about five minutes, and um, I had my dinghy boy hanging around me, and it was really dirty. It was probably three metres, but it was <laughs> And yeah. I was up in the shallows, and I sort of looked to my side, and there was a big uh, big grey shape. And, yeah, we get a lot of seven-gillers down here too. Yeah. And I thought, shit, I'll please be a seven-giller. But as soon as I sort of made eye contact and looked with it, it just turned and came straight towards me. <laughs> oh, oh, no. <laughs> I was like, well, that's not a seven-giller, is it? And um, I had a little... 70 centimetre gun you know but and it wasn't even loaded because I was just swimming in the shallows and I just put that out in front of me and thought oh shit this is going to hurt <laughs> and he, uh, he got just to the end of the gun and then just turned side on and just glided past and I was oh sweet he's just going to have a look at me you know and so that was quite cool once 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 he turned side on you know and I could sort of think oh well, he's just just checking me out so but, um, so whereabouts in, in the bottom well, of the South Island are you? Right, so I live in a place called Athol, which is about an hour and a half from the sea. Okay. And we leave, I've got a big, well, I work on a big boat, it's about 20 metres or 60 foot. We go out to Stewart Island and Fiordland. Okay. For two or three days at a time, come back and unload and head back out. Okay. So, so where, were you this, where were you yesterday with this great white? Oh, just off Bluff in one of the islands out there. Just. So what, what did you do when this great white sort of gone past you? Have you just cruised over to your boat and got the hell out of the water or have you carried yeah. on? Yeah. I yelled a little girl <laughs> and <laughs> got the boat over and jumped in and I moved down the coast about 500 metres. <laughs> <laughs> how, how big was that shark, you reckon? Oh. Yeah, I, he, was, uh, he was over three metres. He wasn't a big white, but he was big. Like, you know, I was sailed around the Pacific and I've dived a lot of those Pacific Islands and seen tigers and bull sharks and that. But this was still bigger than any bull, bull or tiger I'd seen. Wow. Yeah, no thanks. <laughs> he, <laughs> class, mate. He, actually, he actually looked like a dirty version or, you know, a cheap version of a Mako. Because Makos look really nice, you know. They've got the, the slender, pointy nose, black eye, really fluorescent blue. Yeah. They just look like a sleek, real nice looking animal, but... This one had the same shape. He was grey. He scratched it on his nose, and he was like just a yeah, just a cheap version, you know. It sort, of, sort of felt ripped off seeing a massive big shark like that. And, <laughs> and he's a I, think, I think this is one of the scariest things about that story would have been three meters viz, like yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah but, no, I was right up in the shallows. I thought I'd be all right, but yeah, gloomy and shitty. I, I wasn't very keen on diving. Uh, I had a seal underneath me the next time. Next dive, I did. And, <laughs> They're probably leading the shark to you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So bloody clever those things. You dive with seals a lot down there. Yeah, yeah, you know we get seals everywhere and um, sea lions too. Yep. Sea lions are a pain in the ass, but um, the seals I don't mind. They are quite like seals. Uh, you know they've got a bit of character. Just come in and check you out and swim away and come back. Whereas the the sea lions will. They'll get right in your face, and they're you know they're, they're the size of you, if not bigger, and they've got a, a square head that's twice the size of your head, and they're yep, yep. right face and blowing bubbles, and they're charging at you and turning off at the last minute. And you haven't you actually haven't seen the size of Shrek's head, mate. So, <laughs> <but again. laughs> uh. Spearfishing is all about self improvement, but there are some things you can buy off the shelf that are going to help you with your diving. Penetrator blades are lighter and more reactive, and they've improved my diving, and I'm sure they're going to improve yours. Yeah, I've recently switched over to Penetrator Carbons, and it's made a big difference for me. I put much less energy in and get a much greater output, meaning that they are an effective fin. They are lightweight and comfortable, meaning that I spend more time on the bottom. So check out Penetrator Blades at penetrator.com, or check out our new Noob Spiro Edition Penetrator Blade at noobspiro.com. Okay, 
So, moving along. Um, next section of the show is called Veterans Vault. So, this is the part of the show where we, we ask our special guests to take us sort of deep into an area of their expertise. And we started sort of teeing up with you before the show to talk about, like, learning learning hunting techniques for um, mastering a species. And I, I remember you saying before the show, like, you started at such a young age that a lot of the skills kind of just developed over time with experience. And it wasn't like something that you you perhaps consciously learned but I mean so w- when you were when you were starting out like what what's one sort of species that you sort of regularly started shooting and you sort of figured out over a period of time and what did that what was that experience like? I'm not going to go snapper because that's just cliche you know everyone wants to talk about snapper in New Zealand and yeah and um and, you know snapper are, are, they are the hardest fish in New Zealand to hunt and, and yeah you do get big kudos for shooting big snapper but it's just too cliche. I reckon, um, you know, the, the weed edge fish in New Zealand are, are just as just as fun to, to target. Yep. You know, so when I was growing up, uh, shooting a boarfish was pretty pretty special. You know, well, okay. you know, it was just one of those one of those lists uh, one of those fish you wanted to tag off a list as soon as possible. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you just I just spent a lot of time swimming along weed edges, you know, and and um, just trying to find fishy areas where they'd come and sit. And, and now that I'm older and I look back, you know, it was, you see a lot more boarfish these days because you know more about them. You know, they, they seem to school up at, at a certain time of year to, to spawn in certain areas too. So you'll go to one spot and you, you'll, see a, you'll see a school and then you'll know, all right, well, that's sort of an area where they, they hang out and you come back through the winter or, or, you know, later on when it's a little bit less less fishy or, you know, because over here in the winter it's sort of, it's a lot harder to find fish. Yep. And so, they, you know, you sort of have your little spots that you swim along. It might not be one little little rock or anything like that. It might be a, a stretch of 100 metres or 200 metres of coast where you, you, know, you know you're more than likely to pick up something along there. Okay. So yeah, you know, um, with boarfish, it was to me it was just swimming weed edges and and sitting on the bottom as long as I could before you know hoping that one would swim in to check you out. Yeah. So it sounds like you observed a lot of behaviour and kind of what they do over seasons, and I mean it sounds like a lot of accumulated knowledge with experience as well. Um, once you sort of found out where they sort of reside and where you could sort of come across them i mean you've said laying laying on the bottom um are they a fish that will come in at you are they inquisitive yeah yeah um they will if you're sitting on the bottom and they they're in the area and you haven't seen them uh, and you're sitting like on the edge of the sand and that they will come in and check you out but also if you see them from the surface and you're diving down on top of them they can they can spook really easy and they will just beeline it and go on and they won't come back Okay. Yeah. So it's a fine line, you know. When you see one on top, you've got to you've got to be try and get directly on top of it so that it can't judge. You know, it can probably see a see a shape coming down towards it, but it can't judge how far away it is. Right. So and so, if you get directly on top of it and just swim down real slowly, sometimes they will. You know, they won't spook, and you can get close enough to shoot them. Okay. But um, you know, another technique. You can see them in the distance, and you know, not directly below you, but you know, along the along the weed edge, probably 20 or 30 meters or something like that. You can dive down and, and sit in the weed, and just hopefully bring up his attention, and you come become acquisitive and come and have a look at you. Do you employ any techniques like, you know, with some fish you can throw puffs of sand in the air, or you can click a couple of rocks together? Do, do they respond to any of that sort of stuff? Yeah, yeah, six and one, half a dozen the other, you know. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. It just depends. But, you know, like in a competition, if, if you see a fish like that and he's not coming in, you're going to try different technique, you know, try that, sort of flick up the sand, cover your eyes and hope that he's going to come in. Okay. You know, sort of just shift into the weeds so you hide your body and and he can just see, sort of see your, your, your gun stiff it's sticking out or something like that. Yeah, right. And you mentioned uh, certain times of the year their schooling behaviour. So, yeah. so if we can get the rough idea, we don't give everything away. 
um, what time of year that would be and what sort of terrain they'd be schooling up over? To be honest with you, like, I can't remember what time of year it is that they're schooling. I think it's autumnish or something like that. <laughs> Then again, I could be wrong. It could be fucking spring. Um, <laughs> <laughs> love it, from, honestly, love it. <laughs> yeah, I, I remember it being dirty. Yeah. So it probably was coming into winter, but um, or coming out. <laughs> uh, you know, just just certain areas that are usually a little bit deeper, probably about twenty five meters, thirty meters. Yeah. Uh, and it, there'll be a lot of sand around because the bullfish they. Their um, snouts are, are designed to dig into the sand and get the worms out of the sand. Yeah. Ah. So you might find a bit of reef, I don't know, that's in the middle of of a couple of acres of sand or something like that. That that'd be a good place to go because it's obviously going to attract fish and attract um, anything that's living around that area. Yeah, nice. The nice. bullfish bullfish like to come back to the weed and sit there and rest. You know, they'll. Um, go out in the sand, you, you never see them out in, way out in the middle of nowhere in the sand because they're probably moving around trying to find food or forage for food, but then you swim along the weed edge and they usually just tucked in underneath a bit of weed or sitting right beside weed, just having a bit of a rest, trying yep. to camouflage cool. out. So I was, I was going to say like, you know, you came over to Australia and, and took out the national champs <laughs> here, but so obviously like a lot of the, the meta skills you've learned in New Zealand and, and growing up there spearfishing have been able to transfer into different environments. So, like when when you do come over to Australia, how do you how did you learn the species over here and 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 how to hunt them? Were there some common was there some common ground? Yeah, um, hunting fish is a is just a you either you have it or you don't. You know, well I suppose that's not true, but um, there's a difference between going overseas spearfishing for say wahoo or doggies or something like that and going overseas to a competition to to shoot different species yeah you have to, you have to learn the environment you have to learn how the fish react and you know and how different fish how to target different fish so um you know like i say just been doing it since i was young i'm very fortunate to be able to go all over the place and 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 check out these different fish but I suppose when you're a little bit obsessed and you just want to hunt different fish, it sort of comes a lot easier than than um, being forced to do it, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, did, did Paco mention that he beat me by half a percent one year? Yeah, it sounds, <laughs> he, he did, it sounds, actually. Yeah, he, he, yeah. <laughs> it sounded like you guys have, like, a pretty friendly rivalry, though. Like, he, he, he had a lot of respect for you, and, uh, and I, I, it sounds like you got a bit for him as well, so. Yeah, you yeah, know, a lot. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. No, he's... He's a top man. Ah, uh, cool. Okay, so from what I've sort of heard, like you give us a, run, a really good rundown on on both kingfish and boarfish, and what 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 sort of come through really clear to me was your your observation skills. Like they're probably quite far and above most of us because you've been in the water so long, and you also have an active interest in in learning the species and about them. So. Is there anything you could kind of like you, you communicate to people about how to observe fish and how to think about how to hunt them and things like that? The 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 number one thing that you can do is spend time in the water. That's what it comes down to is is just getting in the water and diving. And uh, and the more you dive, the more you're gonna understand things and be able to to um, develop your skills. Yeah, cool. um, there's, there's nothing better than being able to spend a week in the water somewhere and, and learn. I reckon. I, I totally agree. It's all right going for a day here, a day there. When you string a week together, like if you're lucky enough to string a week together, your diving goes through the roof. Yep. Like You start yep. diving so much better and you just you just pick up things you just wouldn't normally. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's just... So, so the, I guess the other thing is like the, a lot of the, champion, the, the competitions, like Paco kind of give us a rundown that – you know, a lot of them will run over a week, like all well, the comps for three days and there's four days prep. Yeah. You know, obviously that's a dedicated kind of week spearfishing. Has that, has that helped you develop your skills more? Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Um, like there's a there's a two end of the scales. There's your competition divers and then there's your your um, your, your species hunters divers, you know, like who, who are not interested in competition but love diving and just want to go and shoot maybe big big wahoo or big doggies or or go to different places and just and just shoot different fish. Yeah. So with the competition divers I've found and with competition is 
you spend a lot more energy or you, you, know, you dedicate a lot more energy to figuring out fish and where they're going to be and how to hunt them. Yep. Whereas um, on the other end of the scale, when, you, you, when you're trophy hunting, I suppose you'd call it, um, you're spending a lot more time in one more place expecting fish to come through because yep. you think you're right on the right spot. Okay. And that's what makes a difference in a competition. Um, you know, the top divers generally you know who they're going to be because they've been in the water for years and they know what the species on the list are and how they act and where, where to find them. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a, you know, like, you you know, I'll get off the back of the boat and I'll look at the bottom and I'll, and I'll you just get a feeling, right, this is how things are going to pan out today. This is, this is the way the tide's going. The tide's going in, so it's going to be running south or it's going to be running north wherever you are and, and um, you know, that, it's dirty, so it's cold on the bottom. The fish are going to be up to the surface in the top 15 metres, or it's clean, it's nice and warm down below. They're going to be deeper as well, you know. Go. So um, when you when you come to a competition, that's an, you know that's I suppose that's a bit off the subject, but you sort of feel if you get a feeling in the morning, you get a feel for what the what the what the day is going to be like, and you have to go on that. You can't go on oh, shit, uh, last week I was diving here and there was lots of big snapper on this point over here. Yeah. You keep that back in your mind, but the tide might be running completely the opposite. The viz might have cleared up by 20 or 30 metres. You know, you might have had shit viz that day and this day you've got 20 metres viz. You know, things aren't going to be the same. It's, it's on the day you've got to know what's what the feel is, you know. Cool. I've got another question that's slightly off, but it's related. What... Like with all the diving you've done in quite a few different places, by the sounds of it, um, what what what's been your absolute favourite fish to to learn to hunt, and how did you kind of approach it? I love hunting reef fish, and in, uh, in the in the tropics, you know, uh, those, those coronation trout. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. They can be a cunning fish to try and hunt. Oh, definitely. <laughs> Another oh. fish I've, I've um, really liked to hunt is um, the long nose emperor. Yep, yep. They're another yeah, wicked know. fish, yeah. They're a bloody hard fish to get. Just for that coronation trout, like, you know, they're the, these brilliant big red and sort of darker coloured fish, and then they've got these yellow yellow strips on the tail and the top. And I've, I, I swear I've followed the same fish for probably an hour, and he's just put put every move under the sun over me. And uh, they are a very challenging species to hunt at times. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's amazing, like... Um... New Zealand, you've got probably ten good species that you might hunt or or you might go out to try and target. Yeah. You go overseas and you guys have got thirty. Yeah, yeah. And you've got the largest, you know, yeah. and uh, and so one, you know, those little coronation trout, you'd probably swim over a couple of them and just think, oh yeah, no, they're just, you know, if you didn't know, if you were beginning to to die, you know, a beginner diver. Yeah. And there's, you start diving on them, oh, shit, they're a bit harder than you think, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah they're, they're nothing like their cousin, the coral trout. Yeah. Just yeah. dumb as, you know. Yeah. But that is a good issue you bring up. Learning your species when you've got such a range is, is actually yeah. quite challenging. And you've sort of got to be sort of like just concentrate on five and then add a couple more and add a couple more and all the rest yeah. of it. Is that sort of how you do it in New Zealand too? Like with guys starting out, they probably target maybe three fish and then slowly expand into other 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 species. Or yeah, yeah, you got to remember that New Zealand species are darn sight easier than Australian ones. You know, you, the only real hard one we've got is the snapper. The rest, if you find them and you put the time in, they're going to come. They're going to find you. They're going to swim up to you. You know, like you, you, the beginners will probably start on like your blue mau mau and your butterfish. Yep. Um, they they are staple, you know. They taste good and yep. they're easy. Um, and then you've got your weed edge fish, which is your boarfish, your John Dory, and your Terrakee. Yep. Now that you know, that's another, you know. So you got your your butterfish and your blue mammy. That's sort of your shallow sort of, you know, muck around. You find them anywhere. And then you go out to your weed edge and you dive that, and you'll find your boarfish, your but uh, your Terrakee, and your and John Dory. And then you can go out and find your drop off or your pelagic fish, like your trevally and your kingfish. And then you get your pink mammal there too, which um, I like a blue mammal, but they're bright pink. Okay. Are they hard or medium to hunt, or are they pretty approachable? Oh, they, yeah, no, they can be very approachable, but then they can be 
very, very hard. Like they, um, they sit out in the open, right, and, and you dive on top of them, and they'll just drift away as you dr- drift down. So they'll just stay just out of distance, just out of distance, and the, you think, oh, yeah, they turn side on to look at you, and you get a little bit close, and then they just turn back down, and they drift down a little bit further. And before you know it, you're at 25 metres, and then you're you know, shit, I'm at 30 metres, and then you think, shit, this thing's not going to stop. <laughs> so uh, they can be they can be really tricky but then if you find them beside reef they can sort of tuck into little guts down and you can just dive down and find them in there that was a really really good veterans vault you mentioned coronation trout sorry to go back to this in the long nose emperor what what are your personal bests on each of those can you remember oh no um no i should no. <laughs> <laughs> I know Paco got a got a bloody good long nose emperor in the Aussie Nationals in Exmouth a few years ago. Okay. Now, that was probably about six kilos. I haven't shot anything that big, but I got, I got one in the Nationals this year. It was only about four kilos. And coronation trout, oh, you know, just your average size. I haven't really seen any big ones. Yeah, yeah okay. It's just more the, more the, the hunting them, you know. Guys, if you're after more podcast action, go and check out our mate Jason Selms over at australianhuntingpodcast.com.au. He talks all things hunting, shooting, and fishing. It's a great listen. He's getting plenty of downloads. He's big in Canada, South Africa, even Japan. It's fantastic. Jason talks to experts in the field on all things shooting, hunting, and fishing. It's a really, really good listen. So go and check him out, australianhuntingpodcast.com.au. The Australian Hunting Podcast is the only hunting, shooting and fishing podcast radio show in Australia. With over 40,000 downloads per month, you are sure to find some information that can help you. If you love hunting, shooting, fishing and a little bit of politics, the Australian Hunting Podcast has you covered. To listen, check us out on iTunes and visit australianhuntingpodcast.com.au. Mate, you've been on the water for a lot of years. You must have had some funny experiences out diving. Could you share one of those with us? <laughs> yeah, we uh, come across some whales one day, and um, and I says, oh, I says, oh, should I, I'll jump in on one? And the boys are like, oh yeah, whatever, you won't do it, right, right, right. <laughs> and uh, and we sort of nosy on up to them, and I, I was in my undies up the front of the boat, and this this whale broached in front of us. Ah, oh, you know, it wasn't. Not, I don't know what type of whale it was, but. So I jumped, you know, I, I overshot the gap and I missed it, and I just sort of got my arm over the shoulder of it, and that just kicked and took off, and it was a bit of a failed attempt, and the boys were giving me assholes about it. But then my mate Julian was like, "Oh, my turn, my turn." So he, he did the same, and uh, he jumped, he jumped out the front of the boat. We sort of waited for the next whale to come past, and it sort of <laughs> come past, approached in front of the boat, and he jumped off and he landed it like a full full rodeo. It was perfect. <laughs> Uh, this whale was not happy and it, uh, like he, he landed just behind the fin because there was a little fin on it and he grabbed onto that and the next thing this whale just took off and just made this massive splash and he just went tumbling down the back of this whale <laughs> uh, yeah I'll probably not explain that well but shit it was funny yeah man oh, it's the proper whale rider right there yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. They were, they were filming the Spiro version. Oh, right. That's pretty another, good. Another good, another good yarn I had, we were, um, you know, back in the day when we were younger and, you know, it, the old man would make us work on, on Sundays because he liked to have the cannons ready for, for Monday. Yeah. But on Saturday night, we'd go and get on the piss too much and um, <laughs> we'd turn up to work hungover and still drunk and it was terrible. But um, <laughs> Julian, Julian was always the worst. He'd always be a lot more hungover than I was and we were diving one day and I was, I was down there and I was catching McKinnas and because uh, it's all snorkel free diving so you're yeah. just up and down up and down all day and I was coming up from a dive and I look over to my right and you've got to remember you're sort of pretty hung over and you don't want to be there and, and life's pretty miserable at the time <laughs> I sort of just glanced over to my right and there's Julian coming up and it's probably about I don't know eight metres deep and he gets about four metres from the surface and he spits out his snorkel and just all of those chunks and just you <laughs> and Tom just follow him up to the surface. He's all the way up to the surface and got to the. He was coughing and spluttering. <laughs> so funny. Did you did you give him a nickname after that? Oh nah. Uh, I don't know. I, was probably about, I didn't have a brain to even think about it then. I, just, <laughs> I 
Um, <laughs> oh, they're too good yarns anyway. Just hung over. Yeah, yeah. The worst. It's the worst job to have hung over. You don't. So what's in your in your dive bag? I mean, you you've already told us um, a little bit of your stuff, but I mean, head to toe, what are you sort of using equipment wise on a on a normal dive day out off off bluff or or fjordland there? Um, you got your fins, but you carbon fiber fins, blades. I've got a uh, seven mil bottoms and a nine. Oh no, nine mil, nine mil bottoms and seven mil top at the moment. Okay. But the thing with Boche suits is they're um, they're probably like a nine mil suit is probably the equivalent to a seven mil suit elsewhere. It's just they're just um, a, a softer rubber. Okay. But it's it's just been cut and um, and designed to. To fit the human body so well, it's just so comfy. Okay. So you can get away with a thicker suit, but um, but it's not as constricting, you know. Yeah, yeah, cool. So yeah, I've got a thick suit, and then I've just got my weight belt. I've got a, a harness weight belt too because you want to spread that weight out. You've got quite a bit of weight, and around the bottom of your back will hurt it. Yeah. Oh yeah, because you've got so such a thick wetsuit on. Yeah, 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 cool. And then just a um, a mask and snorkel. Are you using mostly Boche stuff because they spots here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you like you like the gear as well, though, so. Yeah, the, the actually the mask that I'm using is Boche, but I've had that since I was ten as well. Okay, yeah. that's good. And I've tried other masks and put them on, and I've lasted probably half an hour before I've had to take them off and go back to my old one. It just, you know, when you get used to something so well, it just seems to to work. Yep. Yeah, no worries. It's hard to change, but then yeah, so. No, just my stock standard dive gear. Yeah. Um, haven't got anything special, just a small spear gun to shoot. Because down here we don't have any big fish. We've got blue cod and terakee, uh, which is your guys' jackass moe. And yeah. we've got a trumpeter, which is, I don't know what you guys call it. It's not the Tassie trumpeter, it's a different one. Okay. But, uh, but you guys get it down and down by Tasmania, I think. But um, I was trying to tell Turbo one day how good blue cod tastes. I mean, they they are crap fish to spear because they just swim right up to you most of the time, anyway. I think, but um, yeah, I love them on the plate. They are yeah. unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> you come, I come because I moved down here. I'm from the North Island, and shit, everyone just just so biased. They just love it so much. They won't ever try any other fish. Yeah. <laughs> I thought, you know, what about the North Island fish? You know, they're like, oh, no, that's, that's crap. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's just one-eyed blue cod down here. But, it's you know, it is it is a really, really nice fish. There's no doubt about it. It's, really, you know, pretty hard to beat. Oh, but you got John Dory and everything else as well. So it's not yeah. like there's a shortage of good eating fish in New Zealand. Um, yeah, there is compared to Australia. Shit. Yeah. But um, my my favourite fish probably to eat is that Western Australian Jewfish, eh? Oh um, yeah. Okay. Wow. That's spectacular. Right. Okay. Oh. So you were saying like you've got a lot of smaller fish down there to hunt, so you're using a smaller gun, is that right? Yeah. The, usually the vis isn't too good either, so you you know you just got a little seventy centimetre or, or ninety centimetre gun and just shooting uh, blue cod and terakee and. Blue Moki, that that's a trumpeter that you guys get over there too, but it's not that good. Uh, you know, you've probably got three species. Or you, know, you, you do get butterfish down here as well, so four species down here. Okay. But you've got the, you do have the um, chance, you know, if you spend enough time for the elusive half hooker in New Zealand. Yep. Yeah, 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 yeah. Have you got a good one? No, I've never seen one. Okay. Um, but uh, I've just got to spend more time looking. Yeah. No, normally they're down deeper too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, the, you know, there's certain spots that do come up to 30-odd metres, so just a bit of bouncing around there, you might find one. Okay. It's a bit hard diving that deep when you've got a nine more suit on that way. And, oh, and all yeah, that. I can imagine. There's enough getting down there, but getting up's a different story. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, I think we pretty much covered the dive bag. What do you yeah. Reckon? Today in Dwayne's Dive Bag, we heard a lot about Boche equipment. You can find a comprehensive range of Boche gear at spearfishing.com.au. Shop with our sponsor and support our show. Use the code NoobSpiro at checkout or in store and you can save $20 on all purchases over $200 at spearfishing.com.au. Dwayne, our next section is Fast 5 Facts for Noobs. So, mate, this is basically... Um, 
just rapid fire, five pieces of advice you wished you had when starting out or five pieces of advice you could give new guys starting out. Okay. You ready? Yeah, get ready. Fire away. Get a mask, get a mask that fits well. Yeah. Um, use appropriate gear like a good spear gun. Don't take shit shots. Uh, what's that? Three. So That's I've got three. two more. Yeah. Um, don't dive hungover. And... <laughs> And uh, always dive with a mate. Beautiful. Uh, you going to read those back, Daly, or me? Yeah. So get a mask that fits. Use the right gun for the job. Uh, or use the right equipment for the job, you said. Don't take um, shit shots. So spend a bit of time and get that right. Don't dive hungover and always dive with a mate. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, great fast five. So always dive with a mate you've had some good dive buddies over the years i take it Dwayne. yeah 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 well um you know i keep talking back about, about julian because he sort of grew up with me and then ended up living with us and then uh and so we've always just dived together since we were about 12 years old so i've always had someone to dive with so so when we, when we talk about a good buddy what 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 does that mean for you like um who's someone you want to go diving with what sort kind of I mean, obviously, you have your mates and... You can... In a competition, Yep. Yeah, let's do it. In a comp- you want someone that you can trust to go down there and is going to come back up with the fish. Like, <laughs> you might see a fish at the end of the dive and um, know that it's going to be sitting under that where it's still going to be there, so the next person to go down is going to get it. Yep. So, um, you know, like a, a, a dive you've never dived with and, you know, you're sort of on the spot, oh, yeah, I'll dive with you. You, you say, right, in your dive, right. I can't go. I can't get back down there just yet. But you need to go down there and shoot it. You need to have that confidence that he's going to be able to shoot it and not miss or stuff it up. Yep. Um, but in recreational, it's sort of you just want someone that you can um, enjoy diving with. You know, not someone that's going to argue with you or just want to go somewhere else. And someone that can dive pretty much to your level, so you're both just fishing a weed edge or fishing an area together. Yep. And, um, you know, when when he comes up and says, oh, there's nothing down there, you don't think, should I should go down and have a look? You think, well, there's nothing down there, let's go to the next spot. Yeah, okay. All right, cool. Okay, so you've got a great fast five facts and some good advice about what a good dive buddy looks like. Um, Turbo, anything else from you? No, nah, mate, I've, I've learned heaps. I've enjoyed today's chat. Yeah, um, yeah um, it, look, if, um, if you asked our audience to... Um, do anything, Dwayne, what would it be? You want them to check out a page or come and visit you somewhere? Yeah, I oh know, just bloody, uh, just go dive and have fun. Cool. I'm not too really worried about anything. No, nah, no worries. Well, we're going to link up a few things. Um, you talked about um, a video there about kingfish and that. Well, I'll link up that DVD in the show notes. People might be interested in learning a bit more about that. And uh, and we'll link, yeah. up, we'll link up some of the gear you use in the show notes as well. And... Um, no, we got yep. some got some awesome advice there, particularly about kingfish and boarfish, and uh, but I, I learned a hell of a lot too, and uh, yeah. really enjoyed your great white story as well. <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for joining us, Dwayne. It's great to have you. No, thanks for having me, boys. Hope you enjoyed that interview with Dwayne Herbert, guys. I got heaps out of it. Like, uh, yeah, a lot. Of, I didn't know much about New Zealand species except for uh, the old pink snapper. So. No, it really opened up my eyes and uh, he had some great tips there on uh, how to uh, hunt yellowtail or kingfish as we call them. So yeah, no, very good. So our next interview is with Zimbabwean, now Australian, Rob Gates. Now Rob Gates is a, uh, is an, well, he's a freshwater assassin really. He uh, did a lot of his diving in Lake Kariba over in Zimbabwe around crocs, so we've already heard about his croc stories. But uh, he goes on to tell us uh, how he shoots tilapia and uh, the electric bottlenose over there. He's got some great stories, like cracking stories. So, uh, yeah, we had a great laugh with Rob. So make sure you tune in. I guarantee you're going to love that episode. Thanks for listening. G'day guys, another exciting announcement from our sponsor Adreno. They have a birthday sale starting on June the 18th, running through to July 9th. Um, Last episode we announced the opening of their huge store in Melbourne. That joins their other big stores in Brisbane and Sydney. Very exciting news for Adreno. So head in store, 
Uh, or if you're shopping online, go to spearfishing.com.au, use the code NoobSpiro to save a further $20 on purchases over 200 If you get in on the sale between June 18 and Ju- July 9, you're going to make some big savings on gear. So spearfishing.com.au. Thanks for listening to today's show. Make sure to leave us a review on iTunes or Stitcher. And to learn more about becoming a better Spiro, visit us at noobspiro.com and subscribe to our newsletter. Turbo, why would listeners want to subscribe to the Noob Spiro newsletter? Well, Shrek, if they subscribe to our newsletter, we will send them the Noob Spiro guide to getting started, which includes the dive day equipment checklist. Not only that, you get the top 10 tips for becoming a better Spiro from the world's best and more. Ah, nice. I'm in.